Uh, there will be another hike at 6.15 tomorrow morning. The, the gentlemen leaders say that it will be moderate. So <laughs> if that suits you, join. And now for Randall. Well, thank you so much. I'm always thrilled to be back here. I want to thank uh, Wyatt and Megan, whose patience is just growing more and more. And Adam, who I realized this year is stranger than I realized. He's, <laughs> I like that. He's really... Um, and the rest of the, of the staff who, who you know, make what they do look so easily, easy. And, um, and my other musketeers, all for one and one for all. Uh, and especially uh, to Margot, um, my uh, Hatshepsut, my Boudicca, my Eleanor of Aquitaine, <laughs> my Elizabeth I, my Serena and Venus Williams. <laughs> May you reign long. And to the, the wonderful pot of light around that big table in Spencer, uh, keep on shining, y'all. Um, so I'm reading two, three things, two fiction, one nonfiction, um, two short things. I realize if I call them fragments of a novel, I, I don't have to introduce them. So that's what I'm doing. And uh, um, one is uh, the parents, one is about the parents, and one is from the point of view of the son. Um, so two fiction, one nonfiction, uh, all the truth. <laughs> that messes with some people, I don't know. Buddy Bolden died in 1931 at the age of 54. He was diagnosed with dementia praecox in 1907 and was committed to a mental hospital that year. He never performed in public again. All who had heard him play say he was one of the greatest trumpeters who ever picked up a trumpet. Even Louis Armstrong remained in awe of him. The fact that he, has never, he had never made a recording makes his myth loom even the larger. He died in 1931. Nalida Crockeray was born in 1907. Jean-Luc de Priest was born in 1908. The famous story of their meeting while dancing to Buddy Bolden playing the gut bucket blues is pure fantasy. But neither of them bothered to correct anyone who repeated it. Who got that story started? Was it Jean-Luc in one of his late night poker games at the back of the funeral home? When someone asked Nalita, as late as 1980, what did Buddy Bolden play? She would give her debutante grid and elegantly change the subject. Oh, child, it was so, so long ago, don't you know? Did you see that new Dior collection? I'm mad about it, simply mad. Such frocks. Why don't people use the word frock anymore? I miss the word frock, don't you? More wine. <laughs> Storyville was a funky, though not too distant memory when they met. The establishment was a shadowy, smoke-ridden, blind pig, known only by those who needed to know it as the nursery, now a bookstore in Falberg Marnie. Yes, there was a band, and yes, Nalita was sitting in the lap of a beautiful, alarmingly large, very dark trumpeter who burned for the Creole girl with hellfire in her eyes and with lips like red pillows and with skin like porcelain. And Jean-Luc, skinny and all of 25 and well on in his apprenticeship at the funeral home, looked upon them, upon her, and vowed to himself, that's gonna be me. She's gonna be sitting on my lap looking at me thus and so. For the record, the trumpeter did not go on to fame and fortune and ended his days broken and working on a shrimp boat. 
Truth to tell, at 26, Mademoiselle de Priest had brought nothing but scandal upon the crockery name. And she delighted in the forging of it, one rumor after the other. Her grandmother, Madame Nelida Louise Marie Bonnet Crockeray, <laughs> was a daughter of a Mississippi plantation owner and his octoroon mistress, who had inherited a large portion of an upriver plantation just outside Baton Rouge. The young lady's grandfather, a Haitian-born, Paris-educated Creole, had established a thriving medical practice, which he shared with his son till his death. Twice she had been proposed to by highly marriageable, marriageable young suitors, one a Haitian banker, one a well-regarded history professor at freshly minted at Xavier University, and she begged her father to send her to Paris instead. After a few months, the bills changed his mind and he sent for his daughter's return. Dr. Crockery doted on his youngest child, and while her two older sisters hardened their hearts toward her, and her mother and grandmother scolded her quite regularly, Dr. Crockery bent most willingly to most of her whims. Oh, mon cher. No wonder then that along with her less stuck-up friends, she sought companionship among the gutter dwellers, the finger poppers, the gin guzzlers, the folk of the night, curfew be damned. The maid Musette never snitched and made covering up for her the young mademoiselle's indiscretions an art form. Just be careful, Cher. You don't want to be bringing no child into this world with no ring on your finger. Would you like to dance, mademoiselle? Now coming up to her like some magnificent creature from some magic swamp, bold, bedampled by cheer, enwrapped in a certain bon vivant, when the trumpet play player growled and cast an evil glare his way, her new young Orpheus paid the behemoth no mind. He had her at would you. <laughs> he was tall. He had a country boy's animal-like elegance and power. There was something about the jut of his jaw. Unlike the trumpet player, that wicked lout, that clumsy lovemaker, this boy could tell jokes. This boy seemed to cling to her every word. This boy slipped gifts into the hands of friends, inscribed in a pretty practice script to the prettiest girl who ever walked by the Mississippi. He was largely unlettered and sometimes crude, but he was, as the Reverend Mother might have said, educable. <laughs> Such a lovely word. Such a lovely dark-hued boy, and that smile in his long, long legs, and he could dance, too. That he apprenticed to become an undertaker bothered her not in the least, for unlike so many of her other inappropriate suitors, at least he had money in his purse and was not stingy with it. So what if he lived in a cold water flat in a rotting tenement in the seventh ward? He excited her. She enjoyed being with him, listening to his dreams, tumbling out, and then the way he would halt, become self-conscious. Am I boring you, Cher? Of the many things he was or wasn't, boring was not among them. She enjoyed the company of poor boys with ambition. Twas like something out of a fairy story, and who better the play the fairy princess than herself. Proper courting and sparting was simply out of the question, however. Such a matter of foregone conclusion. There would be no sitting in the family parlor in the big house on Magazine Street, listening to Grand Mia tell stories of being a girl before the war. There would be no slurping gumbo at the table while enduring Cousin Albert's tell body stories in French. There would be no holding hands while attending concert where they played Paganini and Brahms. Though the Cockeray Bonnet family, family was much too refined to say such a thing out loud, a pecan dark bayou rat, no matter how potentially successful, was not the marrying kind, was not their kind. Perhaps the rumor of her being descended from Marie Laveau came from their clandestine meetings in St. Louis Cemetery Number 1. That much was true. 
Were they espied there walking hand in hand on worn February nights? Did someone alert Madame Bonnet Crocaret? Were harsh words exchanged about the grandbaby being seen in public with that untouchable? What are you thinking, child? You could have the world, the world. Just look at you. I forbid it. Do you understand? Or was it planned, agreed upon? Cool-headed as all the actors involved were. A compromise, a business plan, a solution. Nalita already being shrewd and headstrong and an innate businesswoman, both diplomatic and cunning, saying, we will leave town, there will be no scandal. Besides, she was already a spinster, spinster by society standards. He already had a reputation. I hear she goes out every night and she has a certain taste for dark meat I have been given to understand. <laughs> Perhaps the grand dame just waved her hand and nodded a blessing, a good riddance, a foi. Perhaps she did embrace her granddaughter and give her a pick on both cheeks. Perhaps the weary matron imparted some fertile and mystic advice on how to become a successful matriarch. Perhaps she shed a tear the day Nalita and Jean-Luc caught the train, even then already called the Crescent for destinations nor north. Doubtful, though all that might be. Thank you. Okay. If it were vodka, I wouldn't have noticed. Um, <laughs> this is from the, po from the sun a few years later. <sighs> Baseball gloves split and torn and worn yet soft to the touch and smelling of something earthy yet spiritual to a boy, though he has not the words for the spirit does not understand the spirit other than as ghosts and things that go bump in the night and making that satisfying thump when meeting a speeding ball and the plosive bang as a basketball hits the earth or a gym floor and smelly socks discarded for the woman to pick up and dirty underwear and sweat-stained undershirts and shoes, Converse sneakers and boots and brown Oxfords and penny loafers and the line of books on the shelf and the photographs of girls, known girls, local girls and famous girls, Lena Horne and Marigold Peterson and Ava Gardner and Sally Jefferson and his own record player bought with his own money from working in the summers at the funeral home and the black suit he wore that summer and the times they had gone to the beach as a family and the half-hearted attempt attempts to teach Drummond to swim but the salt water stung the five-year-old's eyes and the look upon Junior's face when he heard the war was over and he wondered out loud what it might be like to have gone to war and admitting to his brother how he felt cheated cause I would have made a right fine soldier he said, though he was only 12. And sometimes he had said he wanted to be a pilot because he heard they got colored soldiers, pilots, and would make that rat-a-tat-tat noise and chase drumming around all about upstairs, downstairs. Didn't your mama tell you not to run in this house? Take that outside right now, hollered Frenchie, the woman who helped out his mother then, but only a few days a week. And she was tall, dark, full of mirth, and whose cooking was the first he had ever eaten. And therefore, there was no apple pie like her apple pie, tart and sweet and sour in the mouth, bright and wet, dough, a tender comfort. And don't you come back here tracking any mud either. I just mopped these floors. Youngins, do you hear me? out onto the porch into the yard of a house red brick and white trim in that place in West Chapel Hill where the professional Negroes could safely thrive hard against Carborough, not far from ponds and streams, the yard by the first house Drummond knew 
more human in scale, a room shared with his big brother, watching him grow, watching him study, watching him eat, watching him watching. And there were long walks and spending time with Junior's pals and watching them play basketball, baseball, football, proud that his brother was always the best, wondering if he would ever grow to be the best at anything. And what is the key? And what is a man? And how is he going to get there? And soon he was 11 and he was bigger and Junior was not going about with him as much as he did once upon a time. But they still did. And he did still know all the old friends. Hey, squirt! Them growing big too, becoming men before his eyes. And that day by Bolin Creek and Junior and Billy Padgett were chasing a snake and Drummond fell behind their longer legs running and dodging logs and bushes and chasing because he didn't really like snakes and he was afraid Billy would throw it at him if he caught it. He'd done it before. And Drummond lost the 16 year olds and it took him a spell to find them. Though he wasn't going to call out to them, that would be admitting defeat. And he was 11 and he could do some Daniel Boone stuff himself, track and stuff if he really had to, this he believed. And when he saw them there by that big old oak tree, he thought they were wrestling maybe, standing up, but their lips came together. He knew it wasn't any wrestling and he didn't know or understand why or what. And he didn't want them to see him seeing them. And he turned to go, pretend to get lost this time, pretend. But he didn't take his eyes off them and didn't really move like he expected his feet to move. And Junior had his hand on Billy's shoulder like the way you touch a baby. And Junior was moving back to put his lips against Billy's. And Drummond decided right then and there that he didn't like that and spoke up and said, hey, Junior, what you doing? And Junior pushed Billy up against the oak tree and grinned at Drummond and said, where you been? Took you long enough. And Drummond said, where's the snake at? And when neither of them said anything, he said, well, shouldn't we go? And go they went, and not saying much. And the underbrush was thick, and Drummond never said anything to Junior, and Junior never said anything to Drummond, and Drummond imagined to himself that he had forgotten all about it, and he had, and when his daddy took them on the long drive from West Chapel Hill to Durham, out in the country, fields and trees and space, and showing them the farm he bought, and told them about the house he was preparing to build. Three stories tall, he said, and you'll each have your own room. And daddy, I'll be away at college. Well, son, you can always come back and consider it your home. I'm building it for y'all, for y'all boys, my boys, my good, handsome, sweet boys. And Drummond knew he meant it, and the house was the biggest house imagined he had ever seen. And though it was well out in the middle of the middle of nowhere, he didn't mind moving into it, even though it was lonesome out there for a 14-year-old. And yes, he wished his brother was there to come play with him in the woods, and the snakes out there were much bigger, and therefore he only played out there in the late fall and winter. And it was Frenchy who told him, not his mama, not his daddy. She told him, she told him on the back porch, sitting in a rocking chair, and she was crying, her dark cheeks glistening with tears. And she gathered him into her capable arms and hugged him. And he was crying, but he didn't cry. He was confused. What do you mean jumped off a bridge in some river? What kind of river? And why didn't his mama tell him? And why didn't his daddy tell him? And of course he understood death better than most 14 year olds having grown up seeing dead bodies upon his father's table, their faces sunken ashen, sometimes their eyes glued and open wide and staring at something beyond and woe be unto the father who must prepare his own son for the grave. And why do you like dead bodies, daddy? And I don't like them, son. I just work with them. And why? And well, because first of all, somebody needs to do it and somebody needs to do it right. And, and there's an art to it, son, and a, and a particular satisfaction all around in seeing it done right and comforting the families. You'll understand one day, son. And I don't think I like dead people, daddy. And I don't think I want to do what you do when I grow up. And don't be mad at me because I don't like dead people much. <laughs> and well, son, when you grow up and you and Jean-Luc will have so, so many more opportunities than your old man had and a certain quality of strength shown at receiving the body from Virginia and in the arrangements and art and the funeral at White Rock and a certain lesson to him. And yet he did not understand death in 
the very least, despite its physical presence and its attendant effects on those who surrounded and the grave but behind the big white house looking down upon it from the balcony on the third floor and looking down up his mother's and his relatives, him drifting off and going up there in the middle of the preacher's second last words and not wanting to see Clyde and Fitzhugh throw clods of earth down upon it and watching from above and decided to going deciding to go into the room, Junior's stuff still in boxes and destined to be sorted and boxed, some for the attic, some for the church to distribute, the room that would, in less than eight years, belong to his own son, named after his late uncle and his father, and he kept the baseball gloves and the basketballs and the dirtiest, funkiest pair of sneakers. got a snake in there. <laughs> uh, <laughs> North Carolina. Oh, no, no. It's an it's a unpublished thing. Yeah. And this is a nonfiction. It's named after my hometown, Chinkapin. Um, this is actually from a collection of essays that uh, my colleague Marianne Ginger is doing called um, Place in fiction, place in North, uh, place in North Carolina, sorry. Um, and this is about, uh, it's called Chinkapin, Elementary Particles. The Keenan Family Farm, Chinkapin, Duplin County, North Carolina, United States of America, continent of North America, Western Hemisphere, the Earth, the solar system, the universe, the mind of God. 34.8 degrees west latitude, north latitude, negative 77.82 degrees west longitude, 39 feet above sea level. The northeast Cape Fear River, creeks and brooks like lattice lacework across the land, defining fields and forests, the northernmost edge of the Angola Swamp, home of Venus's flytraps. Longleaf pines and oak and sassafras, maple, sweet gum, cedar, laurel, magnolia, myrtle, shortleaf pine, pitch pine, pond pine, eastern white pine, loblolly pine, sycamore, cottonwood, chokeberry, hemlock, elm, pecan and walnut trees, orchards, apple, pear, plum, scuppernob grape arbors, Weeds and wildflowers and grasses. Poke salad. The American chinkapin tree was practically wiped out by the chestnut blight between 1905 and 1940. Raccoon, opossum, squirrel, field mice, insects, frogs, crayfish, crawdaddies, lamprey eels, catfish, bats, rabbits, deer, bobcat, muskrat, black bear, alligators. Chicken snakes, rattlesnakes, king snakes, black racers, coach whips, hognose snakes, green snakes, garter snakes, coral snakes, milk snakes, corn snakes, cotton mouth moccasins, corn, soybeans, cotton, cucumbers, strawberries, sweet potatoes, peanuts, hogs, cows, more hogs. <laughs> Lots of hogs, chickens, turkeys, even more hogs, indeed more hogs than people, mules already so few by now in the mid-70s, tobacco, tobacco barns, tobacco pack houses, tractors, combines, plows, discs, trucks, truck beds, the billboard, you just missed it, one half mile back, Miss Sally's Diner, churches, first Missionary Baptist Church, St. Louis Baptist Church, Sharon Baptist Church, Chinkapin Presbyterian Church, St. Mark's Church of Christ, Mount Horeb Pentecostal Church, Church of Deliverance and Restoration Pest, uh, Pentecostal Church, known affectionately as the Holy Rollers. 
cemeteries and sparrows and thrushes and robins and cardinals and the occasional egret or heron, bobwhites or quails, hummingbirds, hawks, blue jays, mockingbirds, woodpeckers, turkey buzzards. Stores, Speaker Thomas's General Store, Billy Brinkley's Grocery Store, Parker and Sons General Store and Supply, M.L. Smith and Sons at Mill Swamps, known by everyone as Luther Jim's. <laughs> the glorious ruins of a 19th century train station, two stories, paint gone and done and slowly falling down, the top balcony stubbornly holding on, defying gravity, the physics of collapse, burned down by the Chinkapin Volunteer Fire Department in 1981. The long abandoned rails of a tr train track created to haul lumber at the turn of the 19th century, rusted over, overgrown, yet still there, even now. Bank, United Carolina Bank, closed in 1987. The United States Post Office, schools, Chinkapin Elementary number one, formerly the black school, Chinkapin Elementary number two, formerly the white school, Football, basketball, baseball, mascot, the Indians, the 4-H club. My mother's garden, snap beans, Kentucky wonders, pole beans, butter beans, field peas, okra, cabbage, collards, mustard, Irish potatoes, carrots, beef steak tomatoes, cucumbers, onions, garlic, cayenne pepper, bell pepper, sweet corn, beans, watermelon, begonias, Water, wandering Jew, dahlias, zinnias, geraniums, roses, sunflowers, snapdragons, azaleas. There is more, much, much more. Scents and tastes, the color of things, the sounds of laughter, the sound of dirt landing upon coffins, hymns, pop tunes on the radio, First Loves, Vacation Bible School in June, Murders and Talent Shows. <laughs> the time the carnival came to town. And for me, Star Trek and Charles Dickens and Batman and the Swiss Family Robinson and Spider-Man and Treasure Island and The Hobbit and the intense desire to be elsewhere. <laughs> How could I have forgotten about blueberries? and yet a funky good alliance and gratitude. Chink chicken pin, nof kakalaki. <laughs> Smile when you say that, fella. <laughs> Memory is a Polaroid. Her. There was something about her that rubbed me the wrong way. Maybe it was the way she looked at me. Maybe it was the dip of snuff that never, ever, never left that place between her bottom lip and her gum. The way she spat the brown juice like a laser beam with enough accuracy to f and force to bisect a horsefly in mid-flight. <laughs> I got along with her sons. One was a grade ahead of me in school. One was a grade behind me. One was out of school. One was a lap baby. Her daughter, Trisha, my age, never had a good word to say about me and teased me without mercy. Her older daughter, Anne, looked upon me as if I had escaped from the pound and wondered where the hell the dog catcher was when he was needed most. But with Miss Ella, it was a matter of indifference, impatience, disregard. Maybe I wanted her to like me, and once I sensed I was beyond any sort of affection, I retaliated by disliking her more. She was a large woman, dark of skin, lips large, eyes round, dear round, and sad. She fancied sundresses of the brightest hue. She complained often of the pains in her oversized feet, sandal shod, toes painted fuchsia. Her family was the poorest of the poor, which was mighty poor indeed in Duplin County. Tobacco season was the only time, truly, when they could augment government cheese and garden food with some store-bought food, when everyone could get pay wa day wages and the light bill would get paid. And everyone in the family worked. The baby was more often than not at work, at the workplaces along with her.
I don't remember much, if anything, about her husband. He never came to church. I wondered now if I ever laid eyes on him, not that she ever came to church too often, except on those occasions when they served fried chicken, barbecue, slaw, potato salad, and ice cream afterwards. She never seemed to miss a funeral. Nonetheless, when it came to tying tobacco, she was highly prized and sought after, also as a grader of cured tobacco. Her skills resided in her speed and in her accuracy. She handed tobacco, a deceptively simple activity, three or four good-sized leaves, the stemmed, stems evened out with a hat of the heel of the palm and backhanded to the tire, she accomplished the feat with Henry Ford-like automated precision, always the fastest hand in the South. When she tied, standing over a stick suspended on a wooden spindly horse, grabbing the backhanded bunch of leaves, looping them in twi cotton twine once, twice, and over onto the stick, snug one packet of bound leaves tight against the next and the next until the thing of the wooden stick the length of the wooden stick was full and tied off at the end. Pop! She became a blur, a musician. Zip whir, zip whir, zip whir. God help you if you made her wait too long. And when the stick was completed, loaded down with big bunches of green leaves like oversized praying hands ported downward, she would grunt, stick! This was my cue to come grab the done thing and take it to the pile, which grew from nothing in the morning to a rectangular mountain of emerald by the end of the day. Her contempt for my slowness, or at least by her standards, was one of the burrs between us. When she would spit out the brown juice and say, come on, boy, ain't got all day. You slow as Christmas coming. Where you at? Have mercy. I had been raised to respect my el elders, to be courteous and generous with all, to never sass back, and all that good gospel jazz. <laughs> I did not enjoy the company of this woman. That fateful day, we were pulling, putting in tobacco for my cousin Seymour, who owned a small farm, but who also leased a great many acres from the bigger landowners. This certain field was remote from his farm, and the original barn there had long ago burned down. So we went about our toil on the edge of a copse of trees, on the edge of a particular 50 acres of bright leaf. Under longleaf pines and oak, a tarp had been strung over our heads to keep out the sun and the rain, and more important, but more important, to give some protection to the stacked tobacco. It was a fairly flimsy setup, and the ground beneath our feet was uneven and rough and root interrupted and grass jagged and leaf strewn. As much as I hated working in tobacco, not being under the proper shelter of a tobacco barn made this adventure even more hateful. When the fields had been primed, we would load the pile of tied stick, tobacco sticks onto a flatbed and haul it to one of Seymour's flu-cured flu, flu barns and hang it there, high in the rafters, ready for firing, a hard day's work. There was no Doppler radar or weather channel in those days. For all of us, the day had begun before dawn, so not even Cousin Seymour had heard a weather report, not that anything short of a hurricane would have stopped the day's work. Cropping tobacco went on regardless of temperature or precipitation. The show must go on. The workday began bright and hot and blue skies, sweat and dirt and tar, black tar hands and tobacco fumes and mosquitoes and snakes and plump neon green tobacco worms. Zip were, zip were, zip were. The workday was gossip about soap operas and whose husband was cheating on whose wife and who was in the hospital ailing with what and who had just lost his job and who was pregnant and who was moving back to North Carolina from New York. Zip were, zip were, zip were. The workday was aching backs and sore feet and dirt every which you wear and sweat and bugs and dreams of sleep and supper and more cold water to drink. I remember the clouds gathered with a breathtaking suddenness. All had been clear. 
Now the shadows grew and engulfed all, dramatic enough to make all pause and take notice and comment, mm, child, look like a storm is coming up. Day practically turned into night before the rain began, the wind already gusting. When the water dro droplets, fat aqueous pods, to be more accurate, began to fall at first vertical and very suddenly horizontal, there was no time to retreat. Lightning crashed, thunder rolled, truly. The makeshift tent failed properly. We huddled dark in the dark, torrents drenching at the base of the largest, friendliest oak, wrapped up in the fallen plastic blue tarp, the wind howling. I don't remember being afraid at all, merely amused. After all that hot, it felt good to be wet, as if in a pool, all of a sudden. A number of us younger ones were giggling, snuggled up after a fashion in the dark and the wet. Lightning first, then thunder. You could hear the bolt striking in the distance. That's what creates the thunder. It is God's hammer slicing through the sky. The earth rocks, graves shake, hearts and time stop. The sound of over three million volts of electricity lancing down from the sky is a very different sound. Thunder booms, the sound of electricity cleaving the air, rushing back together. But lightning resounds more like a obliterating zap. Jove's, Jove is angry. Ozone is in the air. No wonder the old ones always made us young ones hush and be very still every time a thundercloud came up. They understood more about the terrible power than we ever could. I don't remember the sound when it hit us, only that the insides of my eyes lit up and the telltale tingle of electricity running through my being's fiber. Does sinew and muscle know it's being shot through with an abundance of electrons? What did Frankenstein's monster think when he was jolted back to life? What does this, how does the soul respond to electricity? Do androids ever dream of tobacco? <laughs> I remember the pause before everyone hollered, screamed, shouted. I remember all of us hauling ourselves up and running every, ourselves to the trucks and cars. I remember fleeing in the rain and dark. I remember sitting in the car, everyone talking at once. Jesus! No one was dead. No one seriously harmed. The lightning had hit the oak. The, elect the energy flowed down into the earth through us. We had been made briefly part of a circuit. I remember a soaked Miss Ella sitting in the back seat of a Chevy Nova, her head moving her head slowly from side to side, saying, Lord, 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 <laughs> breathing heavily as were we all. God was looking out for us, Cousin Seymour later said. The next day I rode with him in his truck to see the sight. A great part of the oak tree was split, its whitish, greenish, tan, vulnerable, wounded looking innards exposed, some sear on its bark. The next evening, after a long, long, long day of work, I remember returning home. I was bone tired, recollecting powerful things for which I had no words, the feeling of electricity, the flash behind my retinas, the odd sense of camaraderie I shared with the fellow workers. Did you feel that? Thinking and wanting school to return in a few blessed weeks when work would be done and hot, dirty fields would be a hateful but necessary member, memory. I remember I was watching a Marty Feldman special on TV. <laughs> Marty back together again. I heard a car drive up and stop in the yard. I went to the door to see who it was. Miss Ella. My mother greeted her on the porch. Miss Ella said hey to me pleasantly, but I stayed behind the green screen door. I said hey back. She brought my mother tomatoes and collard greens. My mother oohed and awed her appreciation at the quality of the produce and thanked Miss Ella, and they sat on the white rocking chairs and talked. Only a few minutes 
less than a full smoked cigarette in time, just catching up a wee touch of gossip. Well, I better get back, Miss Ellis said, rising. Wait a minute, Mama said, and went to fetch, fetch some freshly picked okra for Miss Ella. Why, thank you, she said. Looks good. For some odd reason, I came out onto the porch to say bye. She spat a hyper-fast snuff shot <laughs> off the side of the porch onto my mama's pansies. That was something the other day, won't it? Yes, ma'am, I said. Now you can tell folk you've been struck by lightning. She let out an inky, dark, earthy, loud, unrepentant witch's laugh. <laughs> the very sound of it and the look on her face made me grin. She winked at me. I watched as she got into her beat-up old galaxy, a dull and unpolished metallic silver it was, and I watched it roll on down the dirt road, gaining speed as it went, dust rising up into the approaching twilight air. Those days of rattlesnakes and wild electrons were not lived for me, like a character in a children's book with warm hues and wonderful narrative arcs and gentle old men walking me to the fishing hole, imparting gentle wisdom about how to live a gentle life. <laughs> More often than not, there were mosquitoes and roadkill and spiteful gossip and raunchy tales I should not have been spared. I'm so happy I'm not, I wasn't. Neither were those days free of pettiness and bitterness and downright hatefulness and illness and rounding death. Those days were largely filled by a, a sense of lucklessness and a heavy dose of hard work and seeing others work hard. In truth, Miss Ella treated me not much differently than she had before the lightning strike. Her life had not been altered much at all, but I knew mine would be. Such knowledge is at once a separation and a binding. What I did not know at the time was how indelible were those moments, those characters, people, that place, all of which will follow me all the way down my yellow brick road. Eudora Welty writes, where does the mystery lie? Is it in the fact that place has a more lasting identity than we have and we unswervingly tend to attach ourselves to identity? A thing happened, a thing you shall never forget. It happened here in a place that was known, that has known you and will always know you. By that knowing, you are made. Later that very summer, on not the same day, but on the same porch, I would see the Aurora Borealis. Such a sight so very rarely seen so far south. Filling up the sky, ghostly, multicolored yet largely vastly green. Moving slow yet not moving at all and lazy with power beyond glory. Electrons spilling into our atmosphere above Cousin Norman's house, just across the road, above his barn, above the great oak tree that had lost his great twin in 1947, above the soybean field, above the forest and deer, above us all. According to astronomical records, that day was July 6, 1974. I was 11 years old. Thank you.